I'm going to tell you a story. A while ago, I met an engineer from one of the biggest uh, telecommunication companies in the world. And he was telling me what he does, and he developed an algorithm that optimizes the amount of data that is sent during one phone call. And that was very cool. And I asked him to explain how that works. And he said, well, uh, we actually compress the amount of data. And he played me a sample of music, and then he played a compressed sample, and they were the same. It was amazing. But he said, there was a problem. His company has implemented this algorithm, and it seemed that customers didn't like it. The uh, amount of complaints has risen. People were calling that, uh, saying that they don't understand what is going on with their phone. They can't understand the, the people who are calling them. And the company withdrew the algorithm. And of course, the engineer was very, very disappointed. Uh, so of course, I asked him what he actually did. And he told me that uh, because uh, a speech is, a sound is recorded as a sound wave, he cut a little bit of the top and bottom frequencies in order to compress the data. And to me, as a linguist, it was immediately clear what could have gone wrong with this. You see, when engineers talk about sound, they consider sound a little bit like a substance. They, uh, you, they, they um, process the substance to achieve a desired result. And all kinds of sound are kinds of sound. So music, speech, and noise for an engineer, they are sound. So when the engineer cut off uh, the top and bottom frequencies, what he thought he was doing is a little bit like making the font smaller to fit in two lines of text in one line of text, which, you know, kind of makes sense from that point of view. However, if you're a linguist, you know that music and speech are very, very different things. And for instance, um, language and speech has this kind of sound called plosives. This in Polish is pytyk, bydg. These sounds, if you record them, are on a spectrogram, they are mostly silence. And we know that they are there because at the very beginning of the sound, there is this short burst of air. And this burst of air is recorded in the top and bottom frequencies of the spectrogram. Pytyk and bydg, they are kind of like signposts on our way to understanding words. So, you know, what the scientist was doing, what the engineer was doing from my point of view, was not making the font smaller. He was cutting the bits of text that were sticking out. So, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Anna Yelets, and I'm going to tell you how metaphor can save the world. Humanities researchers and linguists in particular believe that we, want, we are getting closer to understanding what makes people tick. And if people ask me what I'm actually doing at the university, and if I want to be kind of cheeky and annoying, I actually tell them the research titles of things that we do. And these include, for instance, researching collective memory of the Holocaust, or the grammar of shame expressions in Polish and English, the idea of otherness and sin in Puritan American literature, and my personal project, the cognitive role of gesture in um, the abstract concept acquisition of blind kids. And this seems to annoy some people a lot because, you know, from a person, from, from an external and perspective, the investing funding, tax money, into researching the grammar of shame seems, you know, kind of far-fetched for many people. Because linguists very rarely produce new inventions and new technologies. This is what STEM people do. You have, STEM people have all the lab codes and people pressing shiny buttons and, pre uh, and, and developing formulas. All the ki kinds of things that are selling a science and we are investing in STEM fields, in innovation. This very meeting is proof that we are investing in this and we are invested in this concept very much. And we now know more than we've ever known. The amount of knowledge is huge. We understand the world to an unprecedented extent. And we should be very close to this scientific utopia that is taking place, for instance, in, I don't know, Star Trek, The Next Generation. And yet, when you take a look at the anti-vaccination movement, for instance, in the UK, in the US, in France, all very developed countries, uh, the vaccination rates for measles have dropped below 95%. This is the rate that stops the disease from spreading, by the way. 
If you take a look at gun violence, despite all this in the United States, despite all the statistics say, telling people that owning a gun uh, in your home is more dangerous than not having one, people are still rallying in support of having more guns. People, uh, politicians frequently, deny the fact that global warming exists. And my very favorite, um, one politician during the Brexit movement said that the British people are tired of experts. And, you know, Brexit won. So what's going on? How come we're investing all these resources in science and research and we're not getting any closer to our scientific utopia? It's a little bit like, well, we, we as scientists like to think that when there is a problem, people are going to go online, look up the science, take a look at all the nice results and papers and make an informed decision. But it doesn't seem to work that way for the general population. It's frequently as if people don't trust science or don't understand science. So should this change? Absolutely. How can we change this? Well, of course, with metaphor. If you take a look again at the titles of the research papers and you take a look at what lies in the heart of the matter, these are all very abstract concepts, but these concepts have been at the heart of political and social disputes recently and also for many, many years. Concepts like nationalism, what it means to sin, what does it mean to be ashamed and what we should be ashamed of. These concepts should be investigated and these ideas, these concepts are very abstract. However, if we want to understand them, we have one tool that can tell us why people differ so much in understanding them and how these ideas are understood. And we've been using the term metaphor and it's to my um, utmost happi happiness has appeared a, a number of times uh, today. And everyone knows what, what metaphor is. It's describing one thing in terms of another or saying one thing and meaning something else. And when Shakespeare said that, that uh, Juliet is the sun, he didn't mean that Juliet was a cloud of superheated gas. He meant that she was unique and also maybe kind of hot. Uh, so this, however, is not something that happens only in language. Uh, even though uh, psychologists have asked us tricky questions about how can we show that this is not only a language phenomenon. And I wanted to tell you that this metaphor is something that also is present in gesture and in thought. I wanted to show you an example, but we're going to skip it, because if you want it, I'm going to show you it in the question session. Um, so surely, scientists don't use metaphors. We use very concrete language. We say concrete stuff. Well. Take a look at this abstract. This is a full abstract of an anti-vaccination article. First of all, 50% of the language is very abstract language, nothing to do with physical things, with physical experience. It's difficult to understand. And a number of metaphors are used in this very, um, in this, uh, very article. For instance, one instance is if we say child vaccination rates remain high, we conceptualize child vaccination rates as a thing, as a phenomenon. In Polish, we call this rzeczownikoza, so describing a phenomenon, a concept, a process in terms of a thing. And this implies, first of all, that this is a fact, and second of all, that it's a very stable um, situation. Another metaphor that you can see here is that if something remains very high, it's a good thing, because we have this metaphor, higher, the higher, the better. And if you want to uh, compare how that would be in a different kind of, uh, how we could say that differently, you can think of, for instance, saying many, patient, many parents still decline or, uh, sorry, many parents still vaccinate their children. And we're going to skip those examples, sorry. <laughs> so how can metaphor actually save the world? Well, we know that if we use this, this so-called objective language of science, we may not actually say what we want to say. We may not actually convey the um, ideas that we want to convey in science in the way that is going to be understand, understood um, by ordinary lay people. So if we want to change this relationship between science, scientific, uh, the scientific community, the general public, the um, lay person, we need to remember that all of us use our bodies to understand certain phenomena. 
but we use specific aspects of our experience to describe these phenomena. So if we think about metaphor, and we all use metaphors every day, every sentence pretty much, if we think how we use them, we can know what we, we can improve our communication and we can improve the communication between science and business. So thank you very much. So uh, I, I would like to ask you, do you po expect English? Yeah, so we can, no, my możemy mówić po polsku teraz. Uh, bardzo proszę, pytania, dwa pytania po polsku. Andrzej Sikora, Instytut Elektrotechniki, Wrocław. Takie trzy krótkie komentarze. Po pierwsze, fachowiec, który postanowił w ten sposób przeprowadzić kompresję, najwyraźniej miał deficyt wiedzy, jeżeli chodzi o widmo komunikacyjne, jeżeli chodzi o pasmo rozmówne. Po drugie, no, pani użyła tutaj takiego przykładu, no, czysto z, z publikacji. To, to, jest, to jest język, poziom który funkcjonuje tylko między naukowcami. Jeżeli naukowiec zwraca się do, 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 do wiem, opinii publicznej, musi używać rzeczywiście odpowiedniego komunikatu. Natomiast jeżeli chodzi o pełnię moich obaw, która została tutaj dzisiaj sformułowana, jeżeli chodzi o, pomimo te, to ten fakt, że pomimo tego, że coraz więcej ludzi ma dostęp do informacji, a, a z tego nie korzysta w sposób taki, który no, my oczekiwalibyśmy, że popchnie ludzkość do przodu, Ponieważ taka piękna metafora, większość z ludzi w tym momencie jednak woli oglądać te koty. Dziękuję. Dziękuję. I tam drugie pytanie, bardzo proszę. A, jakby tylko komentarz krótki do z kolei mojej działki. Ja zajmowałem się przez lata language engineering in China's foreign policy i takie zagrania metaforyczne wydają mi się niebezpieczne o tyle, o ile mamy do czynienia z trochę innym kontekstem kulturowym. Że gdy wchodzimy w inny obszar, który trochę jest nam znany, trochę nieznany oczywiście, wtedy możemy się wyłożyć totalnie z misunderstanding. Dziękuję bardzo. Dziękuję bardzo. Przykro mi, przykro mi. Bardzo proszę. Odniosę się najpierw do drugiego pytania, to jest komentarza, to jest bardzo fajny komentarz, ale myślę, że mogę się odnieść do Pana wystąpienia również, ponieważ mówił Pan o tym, że sukces niespodziewanie odnoszą ludzie, którzy ładują się w daną kulturę, nie wiedząc nic o niej. Właśnie dlatego, że jeżeli nie wiemy nic o przedstawicielach danej kultury, to będziemy musieli negocjować to, w jaki sposób się wyrażamy. I tak jak tutaj bardzo pięknie było widać na samym początku naszej konferencji, kiedy powstała ta ładna metafora, że ministerstwo zasieje trawkę i zbuduje boisko, wszyscy ją tak spontanicznie podjęli. Pojawili się piłkarze, pojawiła się reprezentacja i pojawiło się takie, takie, takie poczucie wspólnoty, że budujemy jakiś jeden pomysł. I wydaje mi się, że to może tłumaczyć e, ten właśnie fenomen tego, że, że łatwiej jest odnieść sukces czasami, idąc po prostu naiwnie i budując zrozumienia jakby na bieżąco. Jeżeli chodzi o drugo, o pierwsze pytanie, zastanawiam się, tak naprawdę ten inżynier, to jeżeli inżynier spotyka językoznawcę, ja tam byłam w charakterze tłumacza zresztą, to będzie upraszczał rzeczy. Mnie uderzyło w jego wyjaśnieniu to, to, to że on tak naprawdę ten algorytm do przetwarzania mowy stworzył na podstawie muzyki, bo dla niego to był dźwięk. Jeżeli jakość dźwięku jest zachowana, to znaczy, że powinno być ok. Dla mnie to były zupełnie dwie różne rzeczy. Stąd właśnie ten pomysł, że to, to, że rozumiemy czasami tą samą rzecz, mówimy o tej samej rzeczy, nawet we współpracy międzydyscyplinarnej, a tak naprawdę mówimy o dwóch zupełnie różnych pojęciach, czy, czy operacjonalizujemy to w dwa zupełnie różne sposoby. Dobrze, dziękuję bardzo. Wiem, że jeszcze jest kilka osób, ale musimy zostawić to na później, bo jesteśmy i tak w niedoczasie. Bardzo serdecznie dziękuję. dziękuję.